Hello, Internets. My name is Father Casey Cole. I'm a Franciscan friar and Catholic priest, and today I'm answering your questions about the afterlife. While we don't exactly have a whole lot of first-hand accounts to go on, there are a lot of questions that we can answer with confidence. Let's get into it. What happened to the souls of the dead before Jesus? We believe that all salvation and judgment comes through Jesus Christ, and so before his death and resurrection, all the souls went to the realm of the dead called Sheol to wait. That said, the ancient belief was that there was still some separation between the good and the evil, even then, as we can see in the parable of Lazarus. Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham while the rich man was in the tormented place. All of this took place before the resurrection, so it can't be heaven or hell, but there is still a distinction. What is the Church's teaching on children who died through miscarriage or died before they could get baptized? The Church's teaching is that we believe in a God who is loving and merciful, who desires to draw all things to himself. While a child or miscarried baby may have not had the chance to be baptized, an essential element to be united with Christ, we know that God is not bound by the sacraments. If he chooses to save a child, which we think he will, then he can. Whenever in doubt, trust in God's mercy. If someone dies with a mortal sin, however was a good person for most of his life, will he go directly to hell, or does he have a chance to go to purgatory? So there's a lot going on here. First of all, mortal sins are different from venial sins in that they are, as 1 John describes, deadly. As grave matter, they separate us from God. This is not to say, however, that one automatically goes to hell if they have an unrepented mortal sin, nor does it mean that someone without any mortal sins goes directly to heaven. Our salvation is not dependent on our actions, it's dependent on the mercy of God and the sacrifice of Christ. A good person does not earn their salvation through good deeds, and even someone who has sinned is not barred from heaven because of their sins. Finally, there is no reason to think that God's mercy ceases at a person's last breath. While our life is obviously important, we do believe in the unbounded mercy of God. Do I see my deceased pets in the afterlife? This is what is called a disputed question in which there are different schools of thought, and the Church doesn't have a definitive doctrine. Some argue that heaven is only for human beings, those created in the image and likeness of God, who have a human soul. Others, like myself, would say that Jesus came not simply to save humans from sin, but to bring all creation to himself. To think that heaven is just God and human beings, with nothing else from the splendor of creation, just doesn't make sense to me. What is purgatory? I never learned much about it as a Protestant. Let's start with what purgatory is not. Purgatory is not a waiting room for people to be judged, and it is not a place of punishment. Those who are in purgatory are already saved, and God does not will that they be in pain. Rather, it's a state of purification or purging. You can think of it like one of those cleaning rooms before entering high-tech labs. You're allowed in, but you have to make sure that all the static and germs are off of you first. Theologically, we would say that Jesus paid the price on the cross and that that is enough for us to be worthy, but it doesn't mean that we are ready. We may die with bad habits, prejudices, fears, or something else that holds us back. Purgatory is that state of letting all of that go so that we can enter heaven glorified. And so when we talk about the pain of purgatory, it's not because it's punishment, but because saying you're sorry and atoning for your sins can be painful. Which is an important point for our next question, can we still go to hell even if we make it to heaven? Simply put, no. Heaven and hell are final decisions. When one is redeemed and welcomed into heaven, it is because they have been purified and will sin no more. When someone is condemned to hell, it is because they have forfeited all that is good, including their ability to repent. Some may conclude from this that we are not free in heaven then if you can't sin, but that is a misunderstanding of what it means to be free. True freedom is not the ability to do whatever we want, it's the ability to do what is good. Heaven, in fact, is perfect freedom because we are separate from temptation, distortion, or concupiscence. There is no longer a desire for anything sinful. Why doesn't the Old Testament talk about heaven? Two things here. It does, but it takes a little while to develop. First, let's talk about the idea of developing revelation. We believe that God revealed the truth of salvation slowly over time. Abraham didn't know as much as Moses, who didn't know as much as David, who didn't know as much as Isaiah. The mystery of heaven took a while to get to, only really developing during the Greek persecution of the Jews. To put it simply, they interpreted the destruction of their temple and the exile of their people in the 6th century BC as punishment for disobeying God's laws. But a couple hundred years later, when they still experienced persecution at the hands of the Greeks, despite perfect purity and adherence to the law, they came to realize that their prize must not be in this life, but in the one to come. And so, number two, it is in the Bible, but only if you are a Catholic or Orthodox Christian. Because Protestants remove the Greek books from the Old Testament, they do not have this final development and the growing differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees as it relates to the afterlife. I heard we won't be married in heaven. If so, why not? You heard that right. This comes directly from the mouth of Jesus himself. In Matthew 22, he says that there will be no giving or taking of marriage in heaven, but that we will be like the angels of heaven, 
a way of saying that our devotion will be completely to God and not a spouse. Will there be gender in heaven? I think so. I mean, there's not really much talked about it, but there's no reason to believe that our gender will disappear or change when we die and go to heaven. Especially since we believe in the resurrection of the body, I still think that we're going to have our bodies in some form or fashion. What are your thoughts on messages from the dead? Do ghosts or spirits linger on earth? I don't know, but as Catholics, we definitely believe in non-corporeal beings, things like angels and demons, so the idea of ghosts are not out of the realm of possibility. We know from scripture that mediums did contact the dead. That said, I wouldn't put too much stock in it, I definitely wouldn't go looking for it, and I would absolutely not fear it. Focus your attention on the Word of God, and you will have all the direction and protection that you need. If I go to heaven, will I forget all my loved ones? Honestly, I'm not sure on this one. It's another one of those questions that has been too mixed up with culture and popular imagination to know clearly. Scripture doesn't say much, but since human beings are social by nature, and Jesus called us to be one people, I have to think that we will continue to have social relationships. That said, I also have to believe that our relationships with the people from this life will change. The social dynamics and power structures that we navigate today, the hurts and the wounds, the formalities and separations, all of these would have to fade away. Will I still be me in the afterlife? The principles I stood by, the good and bad memories, the interests of human pleasure. As long as these principles were in line with the gospel, I would think so. Tastes and preferences are good and offer spice to life, and so I'd expect them to continue in the afterlife. That said, there are a lot of things that we consider a part of us that make us who we are, that probably shouldn't be. Being hard-headed, aloof, forgetful, flirtatious, and all other personality traits that are in fact sinful need to be let go of. Just because it's normal for us doesn't mean that it is who God made us to be. Are we allowed to be cremated? Traditionally, the Catholic Church did not allow cremation because it was associated with a pagan practice and the desecration of a body. As the cultural approach to this practice has changed over the years, and it is viewed as a more respectful practice today, so too has the church's rules changed. That said, there is still a prohibition against spreading ashes or using them in ordinary objects like a necklace. All bodily remains must be interned, whole, and in a permanent place that ensures the dignity of the body. Is there a moment where it's too late for God's salvation? No. The thief being crucified next to Jesus was in the last moments of his life, but because he acknowledged Jesus as Lord and asked for forgiveness, he was saved. It truly does not matter what you've done or how late it is. If you have true contrition, real sorrow for your sins, and a desire to do everything for the Lord, he will forgive you. This may sound scandalous when you think of someone like Hitler, and it should. Jesus' love is scandalous to the world. Will my glorified body have six-pack abs? Believe it or not, scripture is pretty quiet on this point. That said, if we do, it won't be to attract others or to build ourselves up with pride. People are going to love you and respect you no matter what you look like, so it's really not that important anymore. Is the concept of universal salvation a heresy? It depends what you mean. If by universal salvation you mean that there is a possibility that all can be saved, then no, that's fine. We trust in the mercy of God and do not condemn anyone to hell. That is not our place and we don't know if anyone's actually there. But if by universal salvation you mean that there is an inevitability that all will be saved, that hell is temporary and that all eventually will make it to heaven, then yes, that is a heresy. Scripture speaks readily of judgment, and we know that the wicked will not be admitted. Can I get someone excluded from heaven? I'm a bit worried why you're asking this question, but in general, no. Everyone has free will, and it is not up to us who gets to heaven. On the other hand, we do have the power of influence, and our actions can lead people to evil. Jesus tells us that it would be better to tie a millstone around our necks and to jump into the ocean than to cause a faithful person to stray, and so it's probably a good idea that we don't try. Is the next life the same as the restoration of the garden? I would say that there are similarities, but it is definitely different. In the garden, God was present to Adam and Eve, and there was peace, but there was still separation. God was God, and they were creation. In heaven, there is no more corruption, and there is no more separation. Through a process called divinization, we are purified of our infirmities and brought into the being of God's very self, participating in the divine life. The garden was great, but we don't want to go back there. Heaven is so much better. I've heard people say that praying a rosary every day will make you go to heaven. Is that true? If so, what if you become inconsistent, then go back? Praying the rosary is a good practice that can help us be faithful and develop discipline. But saying the rosary, or any work for that matter, has no direct effect on our salvation. We are not saved by being a good person or following a plan. We are saved by Jesus' death and resurrection. To the extent that we follow him, taking up our own crosses and living as he did, we will be saved. 
And finally, what are your thoughts on C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce? It is one of my favorite books of all time. Basically, it's a poor man's divine comedy. It's about a man who travels from hell to heaven, but along the way, he finds people who decide to turn back and live in hell freely. Why would anyone do this, you ask? Because, as John Milton says, it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. In other words, some people cannot accept, for one reason or another, the complete and total love of God that requires us to deny ourselves and to give up everything for Him. Even when offered heavenly bliss, they can't let go of what they cling to, and they walk away. What I love about the book is that it holds up a mirror to our own lives. How often do we choose ourselves over true happiness? It's a tough question. And really, what an excellent question to end on. As much as we spend our time talking about the life to come, it's really about living this life with a purpose. We know where we've come from, and we know where we want to go. Keep your eyes focused on heaven, and you'll have everything you need here on Earth.